Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Margaret Miller, uh, professor and director of the Institute for Research in Art at the University of South Florida. That's the umbrella for the Contemporary Art Museum, Graphic Studio, and Public Art. The Contemporary Art Museum functions with a faculty advisory council and professor and chair of anthropology, Dr. Antoinette Jackson introduced us to Dorothy Davis, president of the archive that houses the work and ephemera related to the career of her father, Griffith J. Davis. From this introduction, Dorothy Davis, along with Noel Smith, deputy director and curator of Latin American and Caribbean art and Christian Viveros Fonet, CAM's curator at large, collaborated to organize Still Here, the Griffith J. Davis photograph and archive in context. In the exhibition, uh, images and ephemera from the Griffith Davis archive are presented alongside modern and contemporary artworks by important black artists. The exhibition offers a view of black visual culture and history from the 1940s to the present. Artworks were selected to reflect various themes and you will learn more about uh, those themes from the curators tonight. So the plan for the evening is um, uh, to start with Dorothy Davis okay. and she will introduce her father, Griffith J. Davis, a journalist who broke ground, uh, not only a journalist, but a, a photographer, a diplomat, and so much more. You will learn about his distinguished career. After Dorothy finishes her comments, uh, they will be followed by remarks from Noel Smith and Christian Viveros Fonet, who will further introduce the themes of the exhibition and show works by Romar Bearden, Jacob Lawrence, Emery Douglas, Jacob Lawrence, oh, I already said that, uh, Deanna Lawson, Zanelli Maholi, and Hank Willis Thomas. These important works are on loan from the Cornell Museum at Rollins College and from the Ringling Museum of Art in Sarasota. As we are still affected by the COVID pandemic, uh, this exhibition will be presented both virtually and physically. Uh, that means by appointment, students and faculty can come into the museum, but you can view this exhibition um, online. And we have for the first time a full 3D virtual tour of the exhibition plus material from the brochure and more information about the participating artists, etc. So in the chat box, not right now, don't go there yet, uh, you will find a link to that virtual tour. But you can always Google and get into the University of South Florida Contemporary Art Museum and you will find a way uh, to this exhibition and others. So with the help of Dr. Antoinette Jackson, the museum was awarded an internal grant from sponsored research in a category of funding titled, Understanding and Addressing Blackness and Anti-Black Racism in our local, national and international communities. So that gave us a base of funding to support this exhibition. Then we were lucky to receive some generous donations from Susanna and Jan Weymouth, from Mort and Sarah Richter. Uh, a major sponsor for the project is the Stanton Store Embrace the Arts Foundation. And we also use part of our grant money from the Florida Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs. If you are watching tonight on Zoom, you can in the Q&A, put your questions as you're listening to the conversation. If you are live streaming on Facebook, uh, you can put your comments there. So now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dorothy Davis. She has her own uh, distinguished biography. She's a, a pioneer, a global thought leader, a social entrepreneur, a writer, filmmaker, producer, and strategic thinker. She was born in Monrovia, Liberia to US Foreign Service parents. She received her bachelor's degree in broadcasting and film with a minor in political science from Boston University and her MS degree from Columbia University. And that's just a touch of her very distinguished biography. Um, 
She has recently um, been honored uh, by our own Tampa Bay Business for Culture and the Arts uh, for, the, for her uh, presidency of the Griffith Davis Archive. So with that, uh, may I introduce you, it is my great pleasure to do so to Dorothy Davis. Dorothy? Thank you, Margaret, for that introduction and the opportunity to work with the USF CAM team. I want to also thank Dr. Antoinette Jackson for bringing my dad's work to your attention and the sponsors who made it also happen. Thank you, audience, for choosing to spend time with us tonight. My parents, Griff Davis and Muriel Carr Davis, oh, okay, it's coming, would be so honored to know of your interest in them. As their daughter, I am grateful to be able to tell their stories through my dad's photographs. I am also particularly honored to work with my co-curators, Noelle Smith, Deputy Director of CAM, and Christian Viveros Bonet, CAM Curator at Large. They came up with the innovative idea of complementing my dad's photographs with those of amazing contemporary artists. Jacob Lawrence, Romare Bearden, Emery Douglas, Deanna Lawson, Zanelli Moholy, and especially Hank Willis Thomas, the son of Dr. Deborah Willis, the global authority on African-American photographers and photography. She was a friend of my dad and is an advisor to me since after his death in 1993. First, let me ask, how many of you look fondly or cringe at pictures taken of you as a child by your parents. How many of you have visited with your parents on bring a son or a daughter to work day? Travel with your parents on vacation and other trips? As a child, I did not realize until later that my dad converted his passion for taking photographs into a unique combination of professions and that his workplace as a trailblazing photographer, journalist, and US Foreign Service diplomat was the world. Still here, the Griffith J. Davis Photographs and Archives and Context is the first time that his international photographs of Liberia, Ghana, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Tunisia, taken between 1949 and 1960, are being shown in combination with noted writers, musicians, artists, and philosophers. They represent different parts of his three-pronged global career. His preferred media for creating his imageries were the camera, the pen, and typewriter, rather than a paintbrush and canvas. In my presentation, I will provide samples of photographs in each of these six different categories. Yet he left 55,000 images along with related written documentation. Let me first pull up two of my dad's many iconic photographs to give you an idea of what's to come. Here's US President Dwight Eisenhower and Tunisia's founding father and president, Habib Bourguiba, meeting in newly independent Tunisia. Borgiba gave Eisenhower two gazelles and a pretty brown horse as present. While posted in Tunisia, dad was assigned to photograph missionary and Nobel laureate for peace, Dr. Albert Schweitzer at his clinic for lepers in Lombarene, sorry if I messed that one up, Gabon in 1960. Let me next give you a sense of my mom. I later found out that I was my mother's rebellious act against an order of the wife of the first African-American U.S. Ambassador Edward R. Dudley of U.S. Embassy Monrovia, the first U.S. Embassy in Liberia and Africa. Mom said that Mrs. Dudley was planning for the U.S. Embassy to have a celebration of the upcoming historic visit of Gold Coast Prime Minister Kwame Nkrumah to Liberia at the invitation of its president, William B.S. Tubman, 
in January 1953. She had called a meeting of all of the spouses of the foreign service officers working at the U.S. Embassy to discuss having a conga line at the celebration. At the end of the meeting, she told everyone to not get pregnant. This infuriated my mom, who had only arrived with my dad at their first diplomatic post the previous November in 1952. She was not going to allow the U.S. government to dictate when she should have a child. So, without telling my father what had transpired, she took things into her own hands, and voila, I appeared nine months later. I was an instant Foreign Service daughter. While studying at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Dad took a creative writing course taught by visiting Professor Langston Hughes at Atlanta University and who would become a world famous and an American poet, novelist, playwright, and columnist. Their relationship evolved into becoming my dad's mentor and ultimately my parents' lifelong friend. This portrait was taken in 1947 in Mr. Hughes's faculty apartment at Atlanta University dormitory and was the cover of the 1947 pocketbook edition of Mr. Hughes's book, The Ways of White Folk. After graduating from Morehouse in June 1947, Dad became Ebony Magazine's first roving editor at the recommendation of Langston Hughes to John H. Johnson, founder and publisher of Ebony. During this year at Ebony, he shot and wrote numerous stories, including Ebony's 1948 cover story about the honeymoon of singer Nat King Cole and Maria Cole in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. On his drive from Chicago to Mexico to cover that story, he heard that Thurgood Marshall, then chief counsel for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and future U.S. Supreme Court Justice was defending Ada Lois Sipwell in a trial against the University of Oklahoma Law School in Norma, Norman, Oklahoma. It became the precedent-setting case for the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education victory against separate but equal education system in the United States of America. The U.S. Supreme Court later requested a copy of this print for their archive. After graduating from Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism in 1949, Dad became an international freelance photojournalist for Black Star Publishing Company from 1949 to 1952. He appeared in such publications as Fortune, Time, Modern Photography, New York Times, Life, Der Spiegel, Saturday Evening Post. Ebony published his exclusive article and photographs of His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie of Ethiopia as its cover story entitled The Private Life of Emperor Haile Selassie for its fifth anniversary issue of November, 1950. This photo was taken by my dad in August, 1951 as part of a photographic series for his story entitled Waning Empire about the period leading to Nigerian independence in 1960. My dad wrote the caption, Depart to Nigeria, August 1951. Namdi Benjamin Azikwe, shown, shown here, was the driving force, pun intended, behind the nation's independence and became the first president of Nigeria in 1963. He is seen here in an American Hudson sedan that drew applause and cheering of Ziki from Nigerians who crowded roads to see the 46-year-old self-government now champion. While dad was freelancing for Black Star, mom graduated from Spelman College in 1950. She became the first African-American female to work at Doubleday Publishing in New York City. Their friendship blossomed into romance spanning across the Atlantic Ocean. 
In dad's marriage proposal letter to my mom, he said that if she accepted, they would have to marry in Liberia because he had to finish editing the first promotional film, Pepper Birdland, that Liberia's president, William B.S. Tubman, had commissioned him to do. The film was being narrated in Liberia by emerging actor Sidney Poitier. She accepted and took her first trip on a plane from New York to Monrovia in March 1952 to marry my dad. President Tubman attended their wedding reception. Dad's story and photographs of their global honeymoon from Kakata, Liberia to Lisbon, Portugal, Paris, France, and Madrid, Spain, before returning to New York City, was published under the same headline in Ebony Magazine's September 1952 issue. Around this time, Liberia's President Tubman invited Gold Coast Prime Minister Kwame Nkrumah to make an historic visit to Liberia in January 1953. Nkrumah was at the forefront of the independence movement in Africa. Pregnant with me, my mom could not participate in Mrs. Dudley's conga line in honor of Kwame Nkrumah. However, Nkrumah did offer to teach her Gold Coast High Life at a reception held in his honor on President Tubman's yacht. You will notice that she's holding her head high. That's because she was suffering from morning sickness and afraid that she might throw up on him. My brother, Ben, was born two years later. We lived in Liberia for the first four years of my life. We would accompany mom to pick up dad from work at the US Embassy. <coughs> That's really all I knew about his work. Dad took a lot of pictures of us as a family. This photo appeared on the front page of the Liberian newspaper when I was three. I am kissing my friend goodbye. He was leaving Liberia with his family because his father had become Liberia's ambassador to the US. His mother was my godmother. Dad's last assignment as information officer at the US Embassy in Monrovia was to be the official photographer for the US delegation to Ghana's first independence celebration led by then Vice President Richard Nixon in March 1957. On his way to Ghana, Nixon stopped in Liberia. There was a receiving line. My parents told me that they included me in the receiving line to meet the vice president. My mom was holding me in her arms. When Nixon reached our family, he leaned over to give me a kiss. I immediately rejected him. My reaction horrified my parents because they thought it would reflect badly on my dad's career as a foreign service officer. They tried to coerce me to let him give me a kiss. He tried, I rebuffed him again, which I'm very proud of. He moved on to the next person in line. My parents were very upset with me. I was a kid, what did I know? When the U.S. delegation attended Ghana's independence celebration, Dad took the iconic photograph of the first meeting of Vice President Richard Nixon and Martin Luther King Jr. with their respective wives, Patricia Nixon and Coretta Scott King, at a reception hosted by Ghana's Prime Minister and President Kwame Nkrumah in Accra. You'll note that the Gold Coast became Ghana when it became independent. The Kings had just completed the Montgomery bus boycott a few months earlier and were invited by Nkrumah to attend the celebration. It was the first trip to Africa for the Nixon and King family. This photo was not allowed to be shown in the United States of America due to the heightened racial and political climate at the time. The Tampa Bay Times of Florida was the first publication to publish this rare photograph during the 2020 Martin Luther King holiday weekend. Here are some images taken by my dad of Ghana's first Independence Day celebration. Prime Minister Nkrumah, 
his first handover ceremony as part of Ghana's independence celebrations, March 1957, the Ghanaian flag raised for the first time. My dad's photographs appeared in, the, in these issues. Time's cover photo of Nkrumah was taken by my dad. Our second diplomatic post was to newly independent Tunisia from 1957 to 1961. We were among the first wave of American families to be posted there. It was, it was very different from Liberia in climate, population, culture, religion, and language. My mother was the first woman to drive in Tunisia. It was scandalous. She could pass as a Tunisian woman and would often get stopped by the police when she drove. They would let her go when they realized she was American. The photo that you're seeing just now, you go back one, is me and my friends. I believe that was a birthday party at our house in Tunisia. Okay, go forward. As mentioned before, President Habib Bourguiba was the founding father of the nation. Here are a few more photographs of Tunisia. The first is President Bourguiba with my dad in his capacity as US Foreign Service Officer for the US Embassy Tunis. The second one is a newly arrived mobile cinema van that is being inspected at La Goulette Port by Tunisian and US um, officials in circa 1957. My dad is on the far left. I end my presentation this evening with the photograph of writer, playwright, Woli Shuinka of Nigeria, the first Nobel laureate for literature from Africa, receiving an honorary doctorate from Morehouse College President Leroy Keith Jr. in 1988. Institutions from around the world wanted to give Mr. Storinka an honorary degree. He initially refused to accept any of them. When our family was stationed in Nigeria during the Biafran War, my dad became friends with Mr. Storinka. He was therefore able to convince him to accept this honorary degree from his alma mater, Morehouse College, on behalf of all the other institutions that wanted to bestow the same honor on him. When I recently informed Mr. Shurinka about this exhibition, he responded today by writing, perfect timing, era succeeds era this time, the universal relief. My intention through the examples of my dad's work and still here, the Griffith J. Davis Photographs and Archives in Context exhibition is to provide a multi-layered understanding of the impact of his life and profession. Each photograph can be a history lesson, yet the biggest inspiration to me is that it shows what one can accomplish when you follow your passion and choose to explore the road less traveled and especially with your family. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dorothy, for that. And it's been a huge pleasure to work with you on this and to learn about your father's work and his incredible, um, his incredible career. It's been a real revelation for me. So thank you so much. I think we need Christian to come on now. Um, and the next part, Christian and I are going to discuss the contemporary works. So, uh, let's see what happens here. Christian, you're on, but I can't hear you. Is there something happening with your audio? Now? Now you're good. Thanks. There you go. But we can uh, hear you uh, again. You need to be closer? What's happening? Let's see. No? Mm -hmm. yeah. How about now? Now you're good. Now oh. you're good. 
All right. I promise I won't touch it until we're done, until past seven o'clock. Uh, right. So uh, Noel and I are, are, are going to talk over the contributions from the six artists who we've essentially put in, the six contemporary artists that we put in a context um, with Griff Davis's work. Uh, Mark, I think you have a, a slideshow for us. Great. There we go. You want to lead in, uh, Noel? Sure. So this is from um, the artist from Air Bearden, who was born 1911 to 1988. Um, he's one of the most important American artists of the 20th century, known for fusing Cubism and Black culture. He's best known for collages from torn images from popular magazines. So you can see here in Reunion, that's the case. It's a lithographic collage from one of his, um, from one of his collages. It's, that is to say it's, it was photographed and then made into a lithograph. And it actually was um, gonna be part of what was gonna be a projected Ritual Bayou series uh, a three-part pro uh, uh, project actually called Trilogy, but it was so hard to do. It was so hard apparently to work with, um, with this concept that it was never really completed, unfortunately. This actually comes from um, the Cornell Museum. Um, they generously um, loaned it to us. Christian, back to you. Uh, yeah, the loans we've gotten are really fantastic. So I think we'll acknowledge the loans as we go through the images. Um, I don't think I have much to add uh, about this particular image of Bearden's, except maybe to say that um, it, this might very well be that he, he did a lot of socially conscious work, uh, mm -hmm. particularly sort of from the uh, early 60s on, and that like the rest of, of um, uh, the, the rest of the Ritual Bayou series, this probably relates to the Great Migration or the, the event, uh, the Great Migration uh, in some manner. Let's skip to Emery Douglas. All right. Right. So this piece is called The Lumpen. The heirs of Malcolm have picked up the gun from 1970. It's an offset lithograph on paper. Again, a similar process to that of Bearden's. Uh, the loan is from the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins College. Um, at the Rollins College collect, uh, Collection. Um, Douglas was the Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party from 60, 1967 to 1980. Uh, and during that period, he essentially oversaw the art direction and production of the uh, party's official um, propaganda arm, as it was. Uh, um, uh, and th the result of that was really sort of um, a catalog of uh, basically Afrocentric uh, militant iconography uh, with which he and the Panthers intended to really sort of represent black oppression uh, during that period. But this is a really, I mean, this is essentially a recruiting poster and it's a really sort of hardcore image. Um, uh, as I mentioned in the essay that I, that I wrote for the show, uh, Douglas's work was really very much influenced by the leftist politics and the writings of several of Griff Davis's photographic subjects, most notably uh, in Kawe, uh, um, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, who is basically God as George Washington, right? Um, if, you, if you look actually at the top, you might be able to see, and if not, when you look at this piece in person, you'll see the text over the top of the image uh, which says the air, which reads the air of Malcolm have picked up the gun and now stand million strong facing the racist pig oppressor. You get the level of sort of heated language that the Panthers are using now, right? Uh, the female figure is wearing an orange coat and carrying a rifle and she's also got a button. Both figures have buttons and both figures have sort of militant language on the buttons. Um, just a, a tiny word about the word about the word lumpen in the title. The word lumpen is short for lumpen proletariat, which is a term originally used by Karl Marx to describe the most impoverished classes that are unlikely to achieve class consciousness. That's the original Marxian sort of use of the term. 
the way it was picked up by the Panthers was sort of really as a mark of, of distinction almost, of pride and, and, and of authenticity. So I was one. particularly interested in this because of my interest in Cuban revolutionary art and posters. And also, if you look at a lot of the socialist revolutionary art uh, across the globe in the 20th century, this is very, very much allied to that sort of vernacular. Um, they used um, offset lithograph quite a bit, as well as silkscreen, which are easy, um, which are quite accessible. Um, and the, um, the use of rather simple imagery, I think. Um, he, he uh, Douglas really wanted to appeal to the broadest possible spectrum of people um, from children to adults. So he kept everything very simple. And as Christian pointed out, it's also a recruiting poster I did um, pick up somewhere that he was the first one to use the imagery of the pig um, as referring to police, um, which I think is very interesting. I found a, a very nice, you know, he's, he's in his 70s and he's very, very much still active after he retired from the Black Panther Party. Um, he worked for many years for a newspaper in um, San Francisco, retired from that. But he has a very lovely quote here that I think really sort of uh, encapsulated his um, philosophy where he says, art has power, whether it is to exploit you, pacify you, enlighten you or inform you, it's a language. Quite a beautiful statement, I think. We have another one from him, right? We do, but I think if we go, if we if we hit it, we're gonna go way over time, and we want to have no, time. no, no. That's I just we just want to show it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, on to the next. On to Jacob Lawrence. All right. Do you want this, to go first? Would you like to go ahead with this? Sure. Um, so, you know, Lawrence is a guy who who I we probably know best through his Great Migration series, um, uh, which is a, a, almost a mural done in, I don't remember actually the number of panels. I think it's 60, um, sort of eight and a half by five page panels. Um, uh, and it, just a tremendously important work. Uh, he also did, among other things, uh, silk screens, um, which is what you're seeing here. This is a, a, a piece called uh, Revolt on the Amistad. I should immediately point out where it was, where it is on loan from, for, um, on loan from, it's on loan from the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rawlings College. Um, again, what a stress, how generous um, our colleagues at these institutions have been in loaning us work um, that we can put in context or in conversation with, with Grip Davis's um, uh, photographs. Um, this particular uh, lithograph um, is uh, essentially intended to illustrate um, a, a very important revolt uh, of African captives above the Spanish slave ship Amistad. Um, and it was uh, actually made in 1989 to commemorate the 150th birthday, pardon me, anniversary of, of that 1839 revolt. Um, this piece uh, is in the collection, it's in many collections actually, um, but it is um, uh, specifically or uh, importantly in the archives of the US Supreme Court um, alongside one of Griff Davis's photographs. Um, I'll, I'll leave the rest to you, Noah. Well, one of the um, artists who um, Griff Davis photographed and which is in our exhibition is Hale Woodruff and Hale um, was I think one of the first artists for the 100th anniversary of the Amistad. He did a series of um, murals that are at the Savory Library in Alabama. And so uh, it's nice to have that sort of direct connection. Um, 
between one of uh, Davis's subjects and this. I will say that um, it is, as being a silk screen, it appears to have been incredibly difficult. Um, he made a gouache painting of this, and then this was transferred and interpreted to the silk screen. And it has, they used for every color, there's a, there's a separate stencil. And of course, then they have to be all put together. But apparently there were 46 separate stencils and it took nine people four months to be able to do this silk screen, which gives you a whole new appreciation of um, what this is, I think. Let's go on to uh, Deanna Lawson. Um, yeah. I, I, I really I really do love though how a lot of the works that the contemporary works that we brought on board uh, do converse um, often directly with uh, specific images, some of the subjects, their work uh, in, in uh, uh, of Griff Davis's. Um, I, you know it, it, it's it's almost like discovering a, a whole new set of relations. Um, among works that we frankly didn't necessarily know were related in this way, right? It's true. Um, the, this uh, image, which has become sort of really sort of like 21st century iconic is by Dina Lawson. Um, uh, and it's called Blinky and Tony Forever. It's from 2009. It's a pigmented inkjet print. It's on loan uh, to us from the uh, John and Mabel Ringley Museum of Art. Um, uh, Deanna is Brooklyn based um, and, you know, she's really sort of a, about, you know, making these seemingly natural, but basically hyperposed images of um, uh, Black personhood, Black relations, in this case, Black love. Um, this uh, really totemic picture um, was actually taken in her own bedroom rather than in the bedroom of either Blinky or Tony. Um, uh, Blinky and Tony happen to be friends. They're not necessarily lovers. The setup is done in such a way that it's far more suggestive than its individual sort of constituent parts might um, uh, suggest. And there is a sort of a... a a, a pop angel, a, a pop black angel, basically overlooking this couple. Um, and that is Michael Jackson, who's basically, whose album cover is on a poster on the wall there. Um, I should also say that this image was iconic enough that it immediately became an album cover itself. Um, it, it is <clears throat> um, the cover for uh, a musician if, uh, uh, named Blood Orange, uh, his 2016 album, Freetown Sound. Mm -hmm which by the way is fantastic. If you haven't heard it, do go ahead and get it. Um, anything you want to add or? Yeah, just that she's so interested in uh, providing um, an alternative to the disparaging images, stereotypical images of black people. Um, and she's also a little bit a part of a broader movement that recognizes uh, bodies that aren't quite uh, conventional or conventional standards of beauty. And as you pointed out, she's very well known for placing her subjects in interesting environments um, that are very, very chosen. She said that, you know, that they could be anywhere in the world. Um, and, and it's been said that she's as attentive to furniture as she is to faces and bodies, which I think is interesting. All right, we got a couple of more. Let's do some yeah, yeah. next. Maybe you want to go ahead with that, Noel? Sure. Zanelli Maholi is South Af is South African. Um, this, uh, the artist describes themselves as a visual activist, and so basically, we did. This actually comes from again from the Ringling Museum, um, and um, I'd like to say that we did show some of her work in the past. Uh, in our show Sub Rosa in uh, 2013, which gosh, seems a long time ago. Um, but this is a series uh, of a series called, I'm gonna fracture this, Somnanaya mm -hmm. Noyoyama, or Hail the Lark, Dark Lioness, 
which are self-portraits made between uh, 2012 and 2019, as she traveled through cities in Europe, North Africa, South Africa. Um, so in each of these, when she did her self-portrait, she um, notes that where it was taken. Um, so, um, they, they refer to the Western language of portraiture and references to stereotyped images of Africans by ethnographers, Western ethnographers, as well as, of course, drawing on um, African um, imagery. Uh, let's move on to Hank Willis Thomas, who's, who's uh, uh, our last sort of contemporary artist for today. Um, Mark, there you go. Uh, this is called Behind Every Great Man. Um, it is uh, from the collection of uh, the Ringley Museum. Um, and, uh, you know, Hank Willis Thomas, for those of you who don't know him, um, is a very well known conceptual artist whose really primary interests are identity and history, but also advertising. He does a lot of what's called culture jamming, he'll take images. Um, uh, particularly sort of 2D images and um, rejigger them and, and sort of find their, their fault lines um, and often sort of turn, turn the messages that um, they're supposed to uh, uh, issue on their heads um, and, it, and, and often give you their, their inverse, right? Um, uh, as we mentioned somewhere before, um, he is also, he also happens to be the son of Deborah Willis, um, who is this uh, tremendous authority on black photography in America and who um, has worked quite intimately or did work quite intimately with Griff Davis and actually considered Griff Davis a mentor. So again, some of this cross pollinating um, uh, is happening. Um, I, I, <clears throat> to talk about this work, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to go at, at it from a, a side view. I right now I'm talking to you um, about 15 minutes away from a 22 foot sculpture of a black arm with an extended figure um, the, uh, by um, Thomas. Um, it's called Unity. It's at the entrance of the Brooklyn Bridge and depending on whether um, you think that Brooklyn or Manhattan are uh, the most important boroughs. It's either at the end or at, at the exit or at the entrance of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, but I, I sort of wanted to, to, to just point out that the, the meaning of the sculpture, like everything else in the world, has, has changed so radically after what Joe Biden is now calling the cascade of, crisis, of crises of this past year. Um, it morphs from, because this is essentially what the thing is, it looks like this, right, except it's 22 feet, uh, from a sort of we're number one type message to clearly one of racial pride and of power and of inclusion. And I think something similar has happened to this image. Um, uh, you know, rather than just culture jamming, and, 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 and I, I, I ask you to look at the image of the woman here on Mount Rushmore, um, and think about um, Trump having attended Mount, have, have, having uh, done a, a massive rally at, at Mount Rushmore, um, and and ask yourselves whether she's smirking or whether she's smiling, um, and and again to to relate again somewhat outside the show to our sister show in 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 the museum at CAM. Uh, Sarah Douglas is making making monuments um, that opens tomorrow. I think what we see in this in this piece uh, is, among other things, another way of rethinking monuments and memorials. So that's the end, I think, for us with uh, the discussion of the contemporary artworks. Let's maybe move to the next part. Noel, you think? And, sure. and have a conversation with. Um, Let's um, bring Dorothy back, please. And we've got some questions or uh, some items for discussion. Hi, Dorothy. So um, what we envisioned here is that we would have a little conversation among the three of us. Um, and I did, um, I thought 
if I may, I'll start out with a question for you. Um, I've noticed with all, like I said earlier, this has been just a revelation to me, all of this information, these images, it's, it's incredible. So one of the things that really called my attention was there's so many firsts. You know, the first artist to do this, the first artist to do the other, but or the first publication. But I'm very interested in what was going on in the US State Department and with diplomats and embassies at the time. And, you know, I've seen that uh, the State Department uh, maybe not quite so much anymore, but was called, was, they would say it was Yale, male and white, mm -hmm. uh, were virtually the only um, people that were allowed. So your dad was one of the first. Did he ever talk about that experience? Did he ever discuss it with you and some of the things that, that happened? to him and how he felt about that? Uh, no, he didn't talk directly to us about it. I have a brother. And so that's when I say us, that's what I'm referring to. Mm -hmm. But he lived it and we watched him live it. Um, uh, I, the State Department uh, did not send African-American or only sent African-American Foreign Service officers Liberia or Haiti for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, only white males essentially were sent to Europe or any other place. Um, in 1925, Clifton Wharton Sr. was the first African American to become a foreign service exam, a foreign service officer. He passed the exam. Within 24 hours of his passing the exam, the U.S. State Department sent him essentially immediately to Liberia without the, the uh, protocol orientation uh, course. Uh, he also was the only professional African-American at the U.S. State Department at the time. So in that entire building, um, there were other African-Americans, but they were not foreign service officers. So he was sent to, to Liberia. Um, the U.S., as you probably know, has a long history with Liberia. In 1847, the um, former slaves went to Liberia and supposedly discovered Liberia. That, that is a complete, that uh, history lesson is being challenged as we speak um, because basically it doesn't take into account that there were actually Liberians who were already there. <laughs> so that is, you know, that, that, that story is definitely being challenged as it should be. But in any case, the um, America Liberians who essentially evolved out of that grouping, so to speak, um, were in power for a long period of time and probably up until when the 1980 when the coup happened and President Talbert was killed. Um, going back to the, the US Foreign Service and State Department. Um, the Liberia had the first um, U.S. embassy. Uh, it was it had al always been a U.S. legation from from the time that um, uh, Mr. Wart uh, Mr. Wharton came in came over, um, and probably before that. But in 1949. Uh, the U.S. decided to upgrade it to an embassy, thus simultaneously making it the first U.S. embassy in Liberia, but also in Africa. Liberia and Ethiopia were the only non-colonized country, African countries in, uh, on the continent at that time. Um, Liberia and Ethiopia were uh, signers of the um, U.N. Charter. Uh, they had a lot of power at the time. Now, the, the reason, the, since the State Department kept sending U.S. foreign service, African-American foreign service officers to Liberia over a period of years and decades, there was a pool of African-American foreign service officers there when they upgraded 
the uh, upgraded it into the relationship into an embassy level. Um, now, coinciding with that was in January 1949, President Harry Truman decided to have what was eventually called the Point Four Program, which is essentially the beginning of overseas development, U.S. policy of overseas development. And Liberia became one of about three countries that, um, that started this process, this program rather. The, when my parents went, well, when my parents, after my parents got married there, uh, my dad was invited by the then president, uh, the then director of that program in Liberia to take the foreign service exam and then become a foreign service officer and then come back to Liberia for, to be part of the Point Four program. So essentially, he and those who were in that grouping were founders of what we now know as the US Agency for International Development. And that is uh, something that we don't know. In fact, I gave a talk about that at the USAID headquarters um, and in Liberia. So um, the other thing is that when they decided, the US decided to, to upgrade to an embassy, obviously they had to have an ambassador. And so they chose Edward R. Dudley to be the first African-American ambassador anywhere, okay? Um, so that obviously was a big, a, a big move forward. Um, so basically the embassy was uh, full of African-American foreign service officers. They came from HBCUs, most of them came from uh, like my dad was from Morehouse and, and Morgan State was, was there, Fisk University was there, uh, Howard University was there, and, and they were working on specific, um, they, they took specific roles. There were some who were involved with agriculture. My dad was the first information officer. Um, he had had a track record with the government, as, as I said in my talk, and so, um, uh, he created a dark room in our in our house. <laughs> it started a dark room, and then he had to petition or for, to put a pro proposal together to DC headquarters to say you need to give us money so we can establish a dark room and other audiovisual facilities in the actual embassy. Eventually, he was able to convince DC to do that, and that started it. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Dorothy, whether you got to Niger, when you got to Nigeria, um, were were there also sort of a, I don't know, like a wealth of uh, of um, uh, African Americans on staff, or or was it an experience that was really sort of Liberian centric? In Liberia or Nigeria? I I, I, I... Okay, okay, so Nigeria. Okay, so Nigeria. We're in we're in like nineteen sixty six. Yeah, that, I, guess, that, I guess what I'm asking is, is I, I think what you're saying is that there were, it, it, you weren't the only uh, African American family in in, in Liberia. Uh, working, no, right, we were right. surrounded essentially by by African American. Exactly. Family. Now, yeah. when you got to Tunisia, when you got to Nigeria, when you got to when you know when you got to Ghana, um, was that an experience that repeated, or or were yeah. those spaces? diplomatic spaces that still needed to be, as it were, reverse colonized. Yeah, uh, Tunisia, we were one of the very few African-Americans working at the embassy. Um, I remember as a child, I remember two who were our family friends. Um, and so no, we, we were, no. <laughs> the answer to that is no. I, I, Syria I, I, was I, a little I, more I, mixed. I figured, uh, but, but, but wait a minute. I, I, I want to ask you a question about sort of being the executor of, of your dad's estate. And I mean, it, uh, because we got to work together and looking through oh, the actual yeah. archive, right? Yeah. Under not exactly the best of conditions since exactly. it was middle of COVID lockdown and you were moving from New York to, to, to Atlanta yeah. and then uh, some in Tampa, somewhere in between. Yeah, uh, and we were doing it with masks and gloves and special yeah, sort of appointments. It was something. I mean, we we 
we've cooked this up together, the three of us, in the middle of the wave, right? Exactly. Um, but 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 I, I I did I did sort of want to ask you as I was going through the process, you know, um, you know, when you sort of realized that your dad had all these, it's not just the photographs, it's the stories that come with the photographs. Uh, They're so insanely compelling. I, I've sort of wanted to sort of address them even as a piece of parallel history or as a parallel history. But when did you yeah. figure that out? <laughs> Okay, so you have to understand, I guess I need to preface it by saying that uh, my entry into my father's photography world was first as um, a subject, okay? So where they, Ebony published their honeymoon story, a year later, they published a little picture of me being born, the follow-up, I was the follow-up story. Okay, so that was the beginning. Now, from that moment until I, my 20s or 30s, he's still taking pictures all over the place and I am annoyed and he knows I'm annoyed and I'm purposely making faces in his picture just to mess up the picture, right? I mean, so there's that, okay? So, and I, and, but he never really said anything to either my brother or I that he had this, had this other career prior to the foreign service. I mean, we heard about Ebony. We knew he was particularly close to Ebony. We heard John Johnson. We 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 had uh, Lerone Bennett and and uh, and Robert Johnson, the editor of Jet Magazine, and Lerone Bennett became a very well known historian. They went to Morehouse together, and my dad had recommended him, them to John Johnson. Then there was Arabelle Thompson, who was the international editor. She would come to Liberia or to Nigeria, wherever we were, and we would see her. So Ebony was part of our fabric as part of Buyu. But again, I didn't focus on his photographs other than they were annoying. All right, so then he goes on, and, and he knew that's how I felt because I was pretty verbal about it. So anyway, he goes on. So now he retires. He's so talking about 85. He retires from the State Department, and he moves back to his hometown, Atlanta, Georgia. And then all of a sudden I'm seeing photographs framed in the kind of family room. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, I'm so glad dad's picking up his hobby. It's so a wonderful thing that he's picking up his hobby. And I just go about my business because he's, he's, he's occupied. I don't have to worry about him, right? Okay. So then, then he gets sick. He, ha he had uh, prostate cancer. So he gets sick. And um, his friends, his, his childhood friends from Atlanta and so forth, chipped in and decided they wanted to have this, uh, like this, his last exhibit, which is what it essentially was. So I helped them, you know, I, I took the pictures off the walls and everything, and we had it at the Auburn Center, or they had it. And, you know, I was like, okay, well, that's nice. And I'm glad he gets to have this exhibit. That was my first exhibit of going to his exhibit. That was my first. And so then, then, you know, at the exhibit, the, the woman who curated it, who was a, his childhood friend, came up to me and specifically and said, now, you're going to take care of his photograph. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, I'm the daughter. I end up having to do all these things. I have to take the house straight, make it straight. So, you know, I'm thinking, ah, maybe a year, two years, and I'm done. I'm living in New York, though, and the house is in Atlanta. And so... I start, so he dies. My, I start as the executor, which is an uphill learning curve. <laughs> so um, he had, we had a, he had a four bedroom house. Uh, he, he, he had things in different places, let's put it that way. And, and there was one room, which was a total disaster. I said, I started putting it, put going through it and then I would, find a letter from Kwame Nkrumah. And I'm going, uh-oh, this is really important. I can't just pile this in a box and put it somewhere. This is important. And then, it, then I, that's how I started learning his history and putting it together. Thank God he was a journalist, so he wrote it down. So I would pick up a piece of paper or, or some article or something and say, oh, okay, that story is there. And then I would find the photograph somewhere else. And that's how it kind of, that's what I've been doing for the last, I don't know, 25 years, right? 
something like that. So, that, so I was shocked. And then I, and then because I lived with him, Mimi, I, you know, grew up, lived with him in the environment in which these things are happening. Oh. And I remember, I mean, Langston Hughes was some, was, I didn't know who Langston Hughes was as a public persona. I only knew him as mom and dad's friend. That's it. And we went to his house and I remember, you know, being, getting Kool-Aid in his house. That's all I, you know, and, and he would send me books. That's it. I never knew the other side of people, meaning the public side of people. I only knew the personal side of them. And then I had Ooh. to learn that too, as I would go through the letters and everything else. I would have to learn, oh, that was who that was. Oh, that was really, it would have been nice <laughs> if you told me that. Not, not, so. not, everyone, not everyone gets uh, um, an email back from Wally, Wally Sayinka. Um, <laughs> Well, Wally Shinka, the thing is, Wally Shinka was a political activist in Nigeria when dad and, and us, when we were stationed in Nigeria during the Biafran War. He was obviously getting in a whole lot of trouble with government and dad would go and take him out of the, out of, get him out of jail or kind of do something so he didn't end up essentially getting killed. And so that's the relationship they developed. And then later he used the Nobel Prize in Literature. For not right. Right. No, Al? Um, I actually, it's after seven. Okay. So perhaps we might want to, do we have any questions? Um, yeah, yeah, I've got to, I've got three that have come in. All um, right. Two for Dorothy and one a more general question. I'm not sure how much time we'll have, but um, I'll ask the first question that came in for Dorothy. Did growing up amid the African nationalist movement influence your perception of the experience of black Americans in the United States? Oh, that's a good one. Um, yes, it was backward. <laughs> I grew up, I, you got to understand that I grew up, I mean, I was born in Liberia. I grew up in Africa as it was becoming independent. And then I came to the U.S. And then I had to learn what was happening in the U.S. In fact, when I came here and people would say racism this or racism that, I didn't know what they were talking about. And then when I then, but I did know what colonialism was. And so one day I had an aha moment. I said, oh, you're talking about colonialism. That's how I learned about it. And yes, it has shaped me uh, in terms of my perspective. Um, yeah. I know we're in time, so I will keep my <laughs> answer short. Well, uh, another uh, listener or viewer, I guess you'd say, yeah. Antonetta says, uh, hi, Dorothy, wonderful program and such rich stories and information. Thank you. The question is, your dad took a lot of pictures of your family. Did you and your brother ever turn the tables and take pictures of him or your family or other things that impacted him? No. <laughs> we were done with the photograph. <laughs> I mean, we, you know, we, what's an, another photograph? Is like, oh, my God. I mean, he... he um, and then he was protective of his cameras. That was another piece. I mean, we were we were working. We weren't working with Polaroid. We were working with Raleigh's and or he was rather and Canons and uh, you know that kind of camera. So I, no, we could not touch his camera. <laughs> well, there's there's a final question that has come in up to this point. That's I think for for maybe for all all three of you. Um, after putting this exhibition together. What other lesser known histories interest you? And what other stories would you like to tell? You mean regarding the, uh, this exhibition itself? Or? I think maybe re regarding, the, um, re regarding the process of this exhibition, expanding it, going other places with these, uh, these histories, these unfoldings well, of. Yeah, as a personal, um, personally, I'm really interested in the State Department and its racial history. Um, and um, the question I asked Dorothy. Um, so I would personally like to follow up with that. There's been some uh, recent good book on that, et cetera. And I also think it's very important to learn more about Emory Douglas as a kind of unknown or forgotten um, cultural, important cultural figure from the mid 20th century. That's my personal 
um, take away from this among so many other things. Well, that sounds like a good, like a perfect answer and a perfect uh, seg to the end. Um, shall we wrap it up, guys? Sure. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. Thank you for everything. <laughs> it's been a total and absolute pleasure, Dorothy. Um, <laughs> Same here, Christian. You know, it really has. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and we'll leave it with Margaret. Cheers. I add my thanks to all three of you, Dorothy Davis, amazing stories, most interesting work selected for the uh, exhibition. And uh, Noel, um, love hearing from you. Uh, I, should, I could announce here, this is one of Noel's last exhibitions. She's retiring from uh, USF Contemporary Art Museum at the end of this semester. So we love hearing her ideas. And I thought that last question was great to talk about her interest. And Christian will continue to uh, evolve um, ideas and exhibitions and follow up with some of the important themes that come out of this particular project. Uh, so thank you all. And I invite all of the people that are watching to please go and have a look at the USF, University of South Florida Contemporary Art Museum and look at our exhibitions, our exhibition histories. And uh, this talk will be recorded and will be posted so you can review it. And there are other conversations for other exhibitions as well. And so with that, I announce to you now and invite you tomorrow at 11 a.m. the companion or sister exhibition, Marking Monuments curated by Sarah Howard uh, we will have a symposium celebrating the opening of that exhibition. And it's interesting to have these two shows up at the same time because they resonate and they talk to each other and they provoke all kinds of connections. This symposium is titled Reimagining Monuments, Contemporary Interventions in Public Space. And uh, you will have a conversation with the artists that are part of that exhibition. Uh, and they will serve as panelists, uh, Sarah Howard, uh, moderating that discussion. And this will be the first of four uh, part uh, series uh, titled Monument uh, Markers and Memory. And we'll, tomorrow I will tell you about our partners uh, or Sarah's partners in terms of the development of this project. So I hope to see you all tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. for a celebration of the companion exhibition um, uh, um, about monuments and, and how they're uh, being addressed by artists today. So thank you all for being here uh, tonight. And I look forward, as I said, to see you soon. Thank you and good night.